you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, please feel free to put your questions into the chat or Q&A at any time, and we'll leave um, some time at the end to address your questions, and I will help facilitate those to our speakers today. Uh, I would like to start by introducing uh, Dr. Kelly Smith. So as the inaugural Michael Guerin Chair in Patient-Oriented Research at the Michael Guerin Hospital and Associate Professor and Program Lead for Outcomes and Evaluation Graduate Program in the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto, Dr. Smith's research focuses on co-producing practical solutions to the challenges of healthcare delivery with a focus on patient safety and quality improvement. Dr. Smith is a leading investigator in patient-oriented research forging partnerships with patients to co-design research and innovations to improve the quality and safety of healthcare delivery. Dr. Smith has led large-scale implementation and evaluation projects for clinics, hospitals, health centers, and health systems across the U.S. that aim to better integrate evidence into practice. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for being here today. I'll now hand it over to you to introduce your co-speakers and dive into the presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Nicole. And I'm here um, joined by my partners in crime at Michael Guerin Hospital in the Toronto East Health Network. Um, I'm, I'm joined with uh, Lori Bourne, who is the Director of Operational Excellence, and that's a department that has multiple hats, including uh, patient safety, quality improvement, risk management, innovation, and research. Um, I'm also joined uh, with by Christy Lockhart, who is the Medical Director for uh, that same department. <laughs> Um, all of the quality, safety, risk management. Uh, she is also a chair of midwifery for our maternal and uh, newborn child department. So I have the exciting pleasure of talking about readiness for candor in Canada. And uh, Laurie, Christy, and I are going to split up some of our time today. I'm going to talk about, you know, the readiness at the sort of the macro level, looking at the environment. Um, Christy is going to look at the micro level, how ready our clinicians and staff and our administrators to do that. And then Lori's going to also review us at the um, at the meso level, where we're going to look at the hospital and our readiness structures and support systems that we have in place that could prime us for an optimal implementation of a candor type program. So our objectives today are really to describe the environment that we're in and really our programs. Um, we are a large academic community hospital in uh, Toronto, which is the third largest city, I believe, now in North America. And we have um, a great opportunity to and a great culture at the organization. So we're primed and ready for candor. Uh, so I'm really excited to be able to share some of our advancements today. So what do we mean by candor? Uh, most of us know what candor is in the United States, but candor is relatively a new term um, of art or program toolkit in Canada. So I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, so candor is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Qualities uh, framework or implementation toolkit to really bring um, open, honest, and trusted communication to patients and family members early after an event, um, a candor event, or potentially a harm event, depending on how a system um, does that. Also walks through system activation, rapid response and disclosure, um, investigation and analysis, event review and analysis, and then works together in a patient-centered, concerted way um, to formulate a resolution when harm may have not been, um, when things have not gone as planned, but when harm is uh, sort of at the system or potential uh, culpability of, of the individuals involved. So really that whole system works together in an incident response type of way. So I was one of the original uh, team members involved in the seven pillars. And so I tend to look at um, our incident response system in a little bit more granular way, sort of unpack it a little bit more where we go from having an incident report, whether that is a walk-in, somebody calls a hotline, somebody calls somebody, Lori or Christy on the phone and says, something's gone wrong, uh, please help. And that after we get that sort of incident response, the ideal next step would be an immediate investigation. So a quick decision, was the patient harmed, yes or no? And then that initiates a whole host of activations. So potentially an investigation and root cause analysis, 
crisis management team that can be activated, the care for the caregiver, activate a communication consult service. Um, and underpinning all of this is constant, frequent communication with the patients and family members so that we're keeping and maintaining trust. We're sharing openly, honestly, and quickly if possible, what we know. And that may go from knowing nothing to knowing something went wrong. Um, and really just being there for the patient and family, there for our care team members, there for our staff, while this entire um, incident investigation goes on. And of course, if care is deemed to be unreasonable, full disclosure, apology, and remedy there follow. Um, the underpinnings of all of this is learning, <laughs> really making sure that we're a learning organization. And this is sort of the lens that I bring to this particular work uh, at Michael Guerin Hospital and with this particular team, looking at how we might be able to hardwire a system like this um, within the Canadian context. So we also have seven guiding principles that are really based off of uh, some of the work out of the University of Michigan, some of the work out of the University of Illinois at Chicago, um, and then continued on uh, to MedStar Healthcare, where I was working uh, for several years implementing and working in the CANDOR program. So what we wanted to look for is um, we, that we are really committed to providing effective, honest, open communication to patients and family members following harm, apologizing and providing rapid compensation or remediation, when inappropriate or unreasonable medical care causes harm, learning from our mistakes. So that learning loop is really, really critical. Um, making sure that any reckless behavior is subject to corrective actions so that we use things like uh, James Reason's unsafe acts algorithm to help us decide, um, you know, systems, systems error, complete systems error or potential um, opportunity for improvement training or corrective action if it's negligence. And this fifth bullet was really one of the key things that we found when we were doing our seven pillars demonstration project is providing support for providers and staff members and team members involved in some sort of patient safety incident. And really that was what created the culture of safety that uh, really helped to amplify and tilled the soil of um, of an organization to allow an appropriate and, and really allow a seven pillars type program to flourish. So we wanted to apply a readiness filter to see how ready is Canada, how ready is our organization or hospital, and how ready is our, our clinicians and our staff and our teams uh, for a candor type program. And so I'm gonna cover the macro and then I'll hand it off to Lori for the meso and Christy for the micro. And then we have a short sort of Q&A session at the end um, amongst the three of us to talk about what our next steps could be and what our hopes and dreams are for this type of program. So thinking about candor in Canada, I wanted to look into the structures, the policy, legislation, accreditation. And again, I come from the US context. I'm Canadian, but I've been in the US for quite a while and did most of my formative training in patient safety down there. So when I came to Canada, I was thinking, well, I know that they have a program. <laughs> I know they have a patient safety incident response um, toolkit because they were creating theirs as we were creating Candor. So we were really sharing ideas and sharing best practices across the border, even um, back then in 2013 to 2016. So we knew that it, it existed. And so I got to do a little bit of a deep dive in preparation for this talk into what are some of the structures and, and who are the people that we really need to uh, lean into in order to set the stage for an effective uh, adoption of candor. So the environment is actually pretty ready. So the first thing we wanted to point out is the Canadian Incident Analysis Framework. This is an approach that really does support and parallel the candor approach quite closely. Um, it does uh, recommend disclosure. There are disclosure guidelines uh, in Canada that are available for every organization, every clinician. Anyone who delivers care in Canada is, is directed to these particular guidelines. The insurers are on board. In writing, <laughs> the insurers are on board. So the Canadian Medical Protective Agency, which is the leading uh, physician insurer in Canada, 
has disclosure policies um, and uh, does trainings and provides support for clinicians when they need to disclose and help them walk through that process. And then uh, every province or territory except for the Yukon has provincial level legislation, local level legislation around apology. So apologies are protected um, and they're not allowed to be entered into evidence in Canada except in the Yukon. So we're in Ontario, which is why I put the Ontario legislation there. So we are set from that perspective. So the environment is actually pretty good. This is Canada's Candor Toolkit and I'm calling it that because it really does parallel quite closely all of the learnings that we, we had from the seven pillars from the University of Michigan, from our Candor Toolkit demonstration project and put it into place. The one piece I really love here is that they have this close the loop. And when we were talking to individuals at the front, front line, the sharp end, um, those individuals who were reporting as part of that entry into the candor type system, what they were saying is that they rarely learn about the, what happens at the end of this process. Rarely does it make it back to the front line. So I love how this particularly calls it out and highlights it as make sure you close that loop. Uh, so I think that we're ready from the candor, uh, candor <laughs> toolkit perspective. Canada's toolkit is ready. It's there. Um, and it's routinely talked about in pretty much every hospital that I've, I've had that pleasure of working with. There are also disclosure guidelines that really parallel the idea that disclosure is a process and not an event. So again, really preparing for that disclosure, being ready for disclosure, who discloses, when should that initial conversation happen, and making sure that this is a frequent, clear, just the facts conversation. Um, so the guidelines in Canada for disclosure parallel quite tightly the ones that we recommend um, within the Candor Toolkit as well. So all of this was leading me to believe we're ready. We have the, the system is behind us, the environment's behind us. So what we really need to figure out are the medical professionals supported. And so the Canadian Medical Association's Code of Ethics and Professionalism has a disclosure clause. So making sure that we take reasonable steps to prevent and minimize harm to the patient and disclosing to the patient if there's risk of harm or if harm has occurred. The Quebec uh, Code of Ethics for Physicians also has a similar policy for personal integrity and health. So these are two good wins for us, right? Physicians are, are encouraged and as part of their professionalism. Um, across Canada, wherever they practice. The hospital insurers, and I just pulled this from the HEROC, which is one of the larger uh, hospital insurers, they also have um, a mandate to disclose and make sure that it is practical. They support disclosure, they have tools, they have um, trainings, they have uh, reasonable resources to also help organizations to hardwire disclosure into their practices. And then of course, it's the legislation. <laughs> An apology, you know, it, when you go into the different websites and you look into who is defining apology, every single organization has a different definition of apology. So I pulled this one from the Canadian Medical Protective Agency because I thought it was the most fulsome and the most overt. Um, it's right up front in their, in their tools and their toolkit. So I think it's a really important thing that we all get on the same page as to what the apology legislation needs to um, tell us. And this is what uh, in Ontario and in Canada, um, an apology may or may not include. So it does give you some flexibility in what we call an apology. So the protection is actually quite big and broad. So now I'd like to hand it over to Lori uh, to talk about our urban community hospital where, and she'll tell, set up the context a little bit and then share her experiences of uh, working within this context and our mini gap analysis that we conducted um, to look at readiness locally. So I'm gonna hand it off to you, Lori. 
Thanks so much, Kelly, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, so if we just go to the next slide, um, I'll give you a bit more of an introduction to Michael Guerin Hospital. We are part of Toronto East Health Network. Uh, our doors originally opened back in uh, around 1929 um, as a 110-bed uh, general hospital uh, in the, the Toronto area. Since then, um, you can see from the pictures on the screen that we have uh, grown uh, quite a bit. We now have approximately uh, 500 uh, inpatient beds. We see close to 90,000 um, emergency department visits uh, per year, which is one of the busiest um, in Canada. We uh, support close to 1,000 births, and uh, we are now part of East Toronto Health Partners which is um, a partnership of across uh, of about um, 90 organizations in East Toronto that have come together to look to how we can further integrate care uh, and integrate uh, social services uh, within East Toronto. Next slide, please. Uh, so here, uh, for those of you that may or may not be familiar with Toronto, uh, a bit of a geographical map. So you can see we do have a fairly large catchment uh, across uh, across the city of about 400,000 people that we serve. Uh, we do uh, serve one of the most uh, diverse uh, communities uh, in Canada uh, with 21 distinct neighbourhoods, and five of those have been classified by the City of Toronto as uh, neighbourhood improvement areas. So those are priority neighborhoods where the uh, city is specifically investing in to improve the health, social and economic uh, conditions of those neighborhoods. We serve um, a high proportion of low income populations and we have um, over 50 languages uh, spoken um, in our catchment. Um, the one thing that we take a lot of pride in is being a community hospital and forging um, deep partnerships. Um, with the communities that we serve and working uh, with them to help us design our healthcare, uh, uh, I guess, our the services that we offer um, and um, ensuring that the care that we provide uh, meets their unique needs. Next slide, please. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, so as Kelly mentioned, I will speak to a little bit of our readiness assessment from an organization perspective. Um, and I really wanted to start with our people. I think we do have uh, a great foundation to be working off in terms of uh, our culture and the people that choose uh, to work here. Um, this is a picture of some of our frontline staff. We recently launched our new strategic plan and these are our five values of the organization. Um, and during uh, the consultation process of our strategic plan, I think we heard over and over again, whether it was uh, from physicians, from nurses, from support staff, from, um, from patients, from com community members, um, sort of what makes uh, Michael Guerin special. And it's really about uh, the community. People feel like it uh, feel like it's um, it feels like it's family. Um, and it's really the people that are here that uh, want um, that make people want to work here and uh, and keep them here uh, uh, as providers. Um, and I would say that we also have this deep um, sort of unified value um, around courage and wanting to, to do the right thing, even though that may be uh, hard or uncomfortable. Next slide, please. Uh, so we did put together this SOAR analysis. So looking at our strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results. Um, starting with our strengths, uh, as Kelly showed the sort of the Canadian toolkit or, or sort of framework that we based a lot of our uh, patient safety program after, um, I think we do have pretty strong uh, processes that are in place. Many of the pieces, uh, lots of room, I think, as we'll, we'll speak to, um, to further uh, put those together, to bolster them and to further integrate them. Um, but we do have uh, an electronic uh, incident reporting process where we have a fairly good culture uh, of reporting. We have um, hardwired processes for incident reviews, particularly where there's concern around a serious safety event. So in a timely fashion and a standardized fashion, we have a committee that comes together to review those, uh, to do the determination around um, harm and the level of harm that then um, can trigger uh, subsequent uh, uh, processes in terms of, uh, of disclosure or of um, action planning across the department. Um, we also have a number of uh, mechanisms to support transparency uh, within the organization, and one of those are our daily safety check, 
where every day for 15 minutes, our departmental leaders come together. We quickly share our uh, statistics for things like um, the number of days since we had a fall with harm or number of days since our last critical incident, number of days since our last uh, worker workplace violence incident. Uh, and it's also a mechanism that we do a roll call so all departments can raise uh, um, urgent safety issues that need or concerns that need to be addressed. Um, and we also have a, um, a, a long sort of history and strength around our patient engagement. So we do have patient representation on our most senior medical quality and patient safety committee, where we review all our critical and severe incidents and our action plans uh, and scrutinize those to ensure that we feel that those action plans are sufficient and to have a mechanism uh, for monitoring for implementation. Um, in terms of our opportun opportunities, um, absolutely an opportunity around our disclosure process. Um, clinicians, and I know Christy will speak to this more, uh, clinicians are asking for more support uh, around this. I think our processes are not fully standardized. We could be quicker in terms of our disclosure process. Uh, so that is um, definitely an opportunity for us. Um, we do have a good reporting culture regarding uh, patient safety incidents, but we have seen a decline since COVID-19. Um, our healthcare providers and our teams are under much more stress, I think, than pre-pandemic with um, um, HHR uh, shortages, um, um, increased patient demands. And because of that, I think we have uh, seen some, some erosion or some decline of our, of our reporting culture. Um, and then finally, so the last bullet point here that I, I want to point out too, uh, and is a priority for us this year, is around how we can better uh, integrate equity principles into our uh, patient safety review uh, processes uh, and better use uh, race-based data collection uh, to inform our priorities as we move forward. Um, aspirationally, um, uh, really, I think the first two bullet points um, uh, really sum up our, our main aspirations, um, caring for the caregiver program and uh, patient uh, communication uh, consult service. I think this is you know, what we're hearing uh, that our, our teams and our clinicians need and want. Um, and it's something that I think we feel quite passionate about and that it's our responsibility as an organization uh, to be able to provide um, that level of support. Um, and through all of this, you know, our, our goals around sort of the result um, of this is, you know, we want to decrease harm, we want to improve uh, patient safety within the organization, uh, improve um, clinician wellness and uh, psychological safety, uh, and ultimately improve our, our culture of uh, patient safety. So with that, I am going to turn it over uh, to Christy to go through the micro level. Thank you so much, Laurie. So as Lori um, alluded to, disclosure after patient harm is an area where we really see an opportunity to improve with the implementation of a, a CANDOR uh, toolkit at our organization. So disclosure as a clinician is, is one of the hardest things you'll have to do in your career. It's the thing none of us want to ever do is to explain to a patient that harm occurred and um even worse is, is if if the harm was preventable. Um, I think it's the thing that can be career altering. It's the thing that weighs heavily on our minds and that we carry with us as clinicians for long periods of time after the event happened. Um, and, and ultimately, if done poorly, has impact on both the, the patient, the family and the provider. So this is an area that we really do see um, an opportunity for improvement. I'll go through what our current um, processes look and we have, we have quite robust policies. Um, it's the implementation and the standardization and the spread of these policies and the engagement that I think we um, have an opportunity in. Next slide, please. So this is our full disclosure and transparency policy. This is just the title. I didn't include the nine page policy, but it is a 2,500 word nine page policy. It's quite extensive. And I will guarantee you most leaders in the organization and most clinician leads or chiefs of departments as I am, are not intimately aware of all of the details because it is extensive and it breaks down um, many different ways of doing disclosure. There isn't a standardized process. So some processes include going to the manager, some are the chief of department, some is the clinician involved in the harm, sometimes patient um, uh, patient services or is involved. And really what it speaks to is a lack of standardization and probably lack of um, 
training around implementing this policy. And, and as a leader myself in the organization, I am aware of this policy. I've, I've interacted with this policy and I've supported other leaders in, in my role as medical director of quality, but each time it feels new and it feels difficult. Um, and what I hear over and over again from my co-leaders is I need more support with this. I wasn't trained to do this. I may be the best surgeon or the best chief of DI and I'm leading my group, but I actually don't know how to say this. And I, and I'm not going to have to do it alone. Am I, am I going to have to do it alone? I'm like, no, you'll have support, but that support looks different. And then when I go to patient relations or other leaders, they say, okay, well, we do have the policy and we'll lead this part and we'll lead. So it looks different each time. And I think um, that speaks to, to people's willingness. They want to do it and they want to do it right. But our process doesn't exactly lend itself to that always happening. Um, next slide, please. So this is, this speaks to our values, but this comes from our disclosure uh, policy. So we respect the rights of patients to be treated with dignity and respect. All patients and their families will be informed of patient safety incidents involving the patient. Um, and it goes on to really say, you know, this, it, it explains the, the, the value and the reasoning why. So there is a belief, there is a shared belief that this is important work. Um, and I think that that's a great place to start with. We don't have to convince people this is the right thing to do. We have to help them figure out how to do it. Uh, next slide. Um, so we have to go along with our, our nine page policy, we actually have six other policies that support disclosure. Um, so we have our just culture policy, we have our patient safety incident management policy, we have our privacy of health information policy around um, disclosure of personal health, inf health information, we have a checklist. Um, and all of these are important. These are important organizational policies, um, but the important piece is actually that they're streamlined and that they're accessible and that they're being used and implemented and that clinicians and clinician leaders and directors who are doing the disclosure and working with patients have the, the tools at their fingertips and feel comfortable with the tools to, to implement them. The piece here I wanted to really highlight though, which I think is exciting and I know is not everywhere. And this is part of what makes MGH special. We have a patient voice. Um, we have a patient experience partner. We have a strong patient experience panel, and they have created um, an addendum to our disclosure policy that that is the patient voice. It is to bring the the team around the needs and the desires of a patient when you're doing disclosure, and I think that that's an important foundational principle that does need to be there, and um, we have it. And, and that sometimes is one of our biggest barriers is, is believing that that's the right thing to do. And it's, it's right in there. And it's been, there was a lot of thought that was put into putting um, that addendum into the policy. Next slide. So biggest barriers, we have no formalized training. Um, some clinician leaders are trained. Some have, have gone through formalized training, not all. Um, when new leaders come on, uh, especially medical leaders, it's not part of their standardized orientation. Uh, same with new directors. It, it, they, they do get some training, but there isn't a standardized training process around disclosure. I've spoken to, to the, the um, lack of standardization of the process. It seems to look different depending who is involved, the level of severity, um, and when the disclosure needs to happen. And then the type of support that's available really varies. So some, depending on how well you can access support or how connected you are or what the environment that you're working in on the day or time or week, it really varies what type of disclosure support you'll get. Um, and this has a potential to do disclosure poorly, to cause additional stress for our, our staff and additional harm to patients. And it we really miss that window of opportunity to repair. So rather than being a helpful process, it becomes a harmful process and um, definitely not what we're intending to do when we want to do disclosure. I think also a barrier because it isn't hardwired in terms of timing or there isn't concrete um, sort of metrics around when you should 
ideally reach certain targets, there often is a misunderstanding among our clinicians and leaders that you have to have all the answers before you can proceed with disclosure. So there's a deep culture of trying to figure out what when happened, what happened, talk about what happened, create a plan for how it would never happen again without um, actually you know, moving into the disclosure process, even if you don't have all of the answers. Um, that's a good question. Uh, Lori might be able to act that the transparency policy and disclosure policy if it's public. Yeah, it's interesting, the transparency policy that we don't have publicly available, but um, That's not transparent. Yeah. <laughs> we're happy to share it um, if there would be interest uh, with this group. Um, so yeah, that is, that's a very interesting, um, that's a very interesting question and really leans to to sort of how some of these policies aren't widespread, they're not well understood, and there isn't a lot of uptake. Um, next slide, please. So we know, as I alluded to, if disclosure is not done well, it can have an impact on our clinicians. Um, serious safety events, patient harm, with or without disclosure has an impact. It is the thing that that prevents us from wanting to continue in, a, in these, you know, careers that we've chosen. It's also the thing that um, brings fear to work. It's It can cause further safety accidents. It's the thing that leads us to feel disengaged from our passions. Um, and I say passions because I don't believe anybody's in healthcare unless they love it and unless it is their passion. Um, and we need to start centering these patient incidents and disclosure around clinician wellness. At MGH, um, next slide, we do have a culture of wanting to support clinician wellness. It has been prioritized um, by the organization for probably about 15 years. It's been identified as an area to work through. We have a peer-to-peer -peer support program. It was established in 2014. Um, they were able to train 25 physicians I'll give you perspective. We have about 650 credentialed clinicians, physicians, and midwives that work in our organization and um, about 2,500 staff. And this, um, this number, I think, represents maybe the, the lack of scale and spread to this peer-to-peer -peer support program. And it really speaks to only one um, set of providers. And we know that our nurses are, are are needing support. We know that our midwives, we know that our environmental services staff, there is nobody who isn't part of a patient harm or patient safety in incident that um, it, it does not need that support. We have a wellness lead who, uh, and we have a physician champion who was working as the clinician wellness lead. And I believe they were the ones doing the training on disclosure. And I think part of the issue is that there wasn't a, a, a standardized set of resources. There wasn't um, a program of train the peer support or train the trainer that got implemented. Um, and there wasn't, uh, there wasn't widespread activation. So consequently, if next slide, um, this is our peer support, peer to peer support. Consequently, we have this algorithm but most people don't know about it. Some people do, the peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, uh, workers do know about this, but many of our frontline clinician, clinicians don't know or don't know how to activate it. Um, and there are some barriers to activation and implementation of this peer support network. Some of it is technological. Some of it is there, there isn't after hours support. Um, so a lot of the peer support that happens because we do have a desire to support our peers and there's a strong culture of like care and heart at our hospital. That is one of the things that Lori spoke to. And I know Kelly says like people want and have willingness to do this right. So it happens informally, to be honest. It's um, It often is leadership that will reach out or other colleagues, we're close knit type of, of group um, of healthcare providers. But it does mean that again, sometimes it's not done in the way that the provider needs. And it comes at a cost um, sometimes to those in leadership because you may be managing multiple balls in the air, but you're also worried about your staff. And as a leader, having a formalized um, peer support network would be something I would be so grateful for because then it would be something that I could add to, but 
know that my group or my staff member is being taken care of. Um, I'll go to the next slide. So this is our current state, as I showed you our process. So it's not routinely triggered. It's only meeting the needs of one um, group of providers at this point. We do have a clinician wellness committee. So we have a multidisciplinary committee looking at clinician wellness. We have a recognition at our hospital. We don't have to explain to anybody that staff engagement, that wellness and patient safety are interwoven. That language um, is, is part of our strat plan. It's part of what we do when we do engagement surveys with our staff. But we have a lack of formalized wellness rules. So there isn't a, like a strong investment in either medical leadership for wellness or a wellness department. There is one person who's trying to do a lot and trying to provide a lot of support to a lot of different areas. And we likely need more investment in organizational support. We also have certain areas that have adopted their own protocols or have implemented protocols, but again, it's only in one area. So the emergency department, they had high uptake around a protocol that was rolled out about 12 years ago, the second victim protocol, and they do implement that. And that provides support for staff and time off the floor and a, an, in, an immediate uh, hot debrief after an incident, but it's not routinely implemented in other areas of the hospital. Um, we have support through um, EAP, which we know can be very helpful for, for people to have support from outside the organization. But we also know that sometimes you wanna hear from your peers. You wanna hear from the people you go to work with every day. You wanna hear from the other person who knew that patient or who knew the situation or who you're gonna to have to work with when you come back to work. So having the peer-to-peer -peer support and having wellness built into how we engage with our staff um, you know, might make the EAP program complementary as opposed to one of the primary avenues that people have. And then we have spiritual care um, and wellness who will provide support when asked. And sometimes leaders will bring in spiritual care. So again, it's it's a bit fragmented and um, probably a lack of a standardized process. Next slide, please. Um, I will say more than ever, we're ready. We're ready for more. And I think this this speaks to um, I think it speaks to where people are at. And I don't, I know it's no different in the states than it is in Canada, but we are tired. Um, there's been a lot of post pandemic fatigue and burnout. We feel like we've been through something. There is um, a collective feeling of trauma within healthcare that hasn't gone away as quickly as any of us had hoped. Um, we have increased healthcare pressures that like we've never seen before. Um, we have increased workplace violence in the hospital. We have more um, disruptive patients, more patients with mental health concerns. And I think all of that speaks to, to you know, the pressures that our communities are facing as well. We need sustainable solutions that will support our team. And we, we can't sort of miss this opportunity of, of staff asking for more and then, and knowing they need more without going forward and fully giving them everything we've got to sort of implement a program where they feel held, where they feel supported, and that ultimately benefits our staff, but truly also benefits our patients. So I'm going to pass it over to um, Kelly, who's going to lead us through a roundtable. So thank you. Thank you both, uh, Laurie and Christy, for your reflections on our current state at Michael Guerin Hospital. I have one question to start us off, and then I'll go to the chat, if that's okay. Um, what do you really hope to see, and you can answer it individually, um, as we further explore how to integrate all of the different pieces that MGH has so that they're hardwired into our incident response system? And I'm going to take notes for this. <laughs> okay, I'll start, Lori. I mean, I'll speak from I'll speak from the physician um, clinician side of things. So I, I alluded to this at the end of my presentation, but really, I want our providers to feel like the organization has them. They've got their back. They're holding them through these difficult process. They're walking through the process with them. They are not alone in the process. And that when they reach out or when something happens, that 
it's there. It's there for them. And that they don't even have to reach out because actually sometimes that's the hardest thing to do is to reach out for help. But that the the process that walks you through the support you need after a patient safety incident or the disclosure or the root cause analysis or whatever it is that you have a hardwired process of support that follows you from beginning to end. And then I can't talk about provider experience without talking about patient experience, but I hope that that would nurture a culture um, and, and nurture our culture of patient safety, that providers will feel a lot less fear around reporting safety incidents, that they will fear um, less fear about making mistakes because they'll know that um, it's treated with respect and care and learning and that there'll be a process that will catch them through that. And ultimately that's going to make things better for our patients. Our patients will, will appreciate that transparency. They'll appreciate knowing their providers are with them on this journey, as opposed to coming to them when it, after it's happened, when they've have all the answers. Um, I think that's the main things I would, I would love to see through this. Go for it, Lori. I'll just, I'll just build off of your answer there, Christy. Um, you know, I think ultimately uh, really want to see fewer incidents of harm taking place uh, within the organization and um, us strengthening our ability to learn from those incidents that do happen and being more open and transparent and have a standardized process to bring us through so that we can glean those learnings and put those um, actions into place to, to prevent future harm. Um, and then also just sort of building off of Christy's comments just about the experience, of course, for our care teams and for our patients, um, you know, being involved in a, 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 a patient safety incident or an event of harm as a patient, you know, I want to make sure that following that that event, um, we are being compassionate and supportive and it's not sort of re-traumatizing sort of with uh, the, the ongoing follow-up uh, with the providers and with the organization. Uh, so, so looking to, to shift and support or improve, I guess, the, the experience of our patients and families um, following an unfortunate um, event. Great, thank you. Um, the one thing I do want to highlight, I'm not sure we don't sort of call out our excellence in this, but I do want to point out one of the reasons I went to MGH and MGH was so attractive was that they put all their patient safety wisdom onto the website, which was really great. And they had their safety strategic plan. And I sit on the medical um, patient safety and quality committee. And I was honestly in awe the first time I, I went there because a patient was also sits on that committee. So there's a patient representative, the conscious of the community, and our community is quite tightly aligned and knit within our um, within our hospital. So it was really fantastic to see that that patients had a place at the table in sort of an event review um, meeting. It was it was everything's laid out. So the level of transparency with our patient experience partners is really quite remarkable. Um, so Julia has a question, and I'll leave it up to you too, who gets to answer this one. Uh, do you have a timeline of expectation of how soon uh, um, the event should be reported, um, the patient and family member contacted, and the review completed? And then do you have anything on timeliness with respect to the final disclosure with the patient and family member? So it's really, I think, the timeline from the start to finish of the the candor loop. Um, I can start, but Christy, uh, uh, please, please chime in. Um, and this probably is an like I would probably an area that we can be better in. Um, I know our policies; it's all about like as quickly as possible that we start the disclosure. Sometimes uh, when the the harm is known right away, that that's in the the moment, uh, like at the point of care. Um, but sometimes harm is not sort of realized until later. Um, we uh, we don't have standard timelines in terms of sort of the, the continual follow-up and the continual disclosure. Um, mainly at this point, sort of, I think given that each review um, has it, their own nuances in terms of uh, the number of departments that are involved or external um, organizations sometimes. Um, so sometimes we're not quite able to sort of 
uh, put an exact turnaround time, but maybe that is actually something that we should be uh, striving towards. Um, I know it's something that our department with patient relations and, and with Christy that is top of mind for us to ensure that we're sort of following those incidents along and, and moving those disclosure discussions uh, forward. Um, but I think it's, it's a great question and I think something that we should be uh, looking to farther uh, uh, refine, I think, as we move forward. Um, yeah, and I would I would just add that we do attempt, so we review um, if it was serious or critical, uh, so severe uh, patient harm or critical cause like death um, in a patient, then we would um, review every Tuesday. And there is an algorithm to follow after that that would include disclosure. Um, and our policy, I think, says like ideally within 48 hours. We don't have standardized policies around other than as soon as feasible or as soon as possible for other incidents of harm. And I would say that um, the, the tendency tends to be to wait until we have, the culture is a little bit to wait till we have more fulsome answers. And because logistically we don't have a process as to like a disclosure team, for instance, or a disclosure department, it's very dependent on who's going to do it logistically getting several leaders or several clinicians plus patient relations organized often takes several weeks. Um, so it's, it can seem long. Um, I had imagined for the patients because it seems long as a provider. Uh, uh, but the, the intention is to do it as soon as possible. And I would say, um, I would echo what Laurie said that patient uh, patient safety and quality team is very good at encouraging and pushing and, and sort of shepherding the process along, um, but to various degrees of success with various degrees of departments. Some departments are, are quite timely and other departments, uh, depending on what they're dealing with, are, are less timely. So definitely an area for us to improve. Terrific. And another one I saw in the chat was from Christina, who provides the disclosure training for our hospital? I'm actually interested in that too. So I tried to answer this because I saw it in the chat in my side. We have, I believe it was um, our like person who coordinates clinic, like clinician wellness, who does the wellness, but I would have to confirm with her. Um, but I think and we have one physician lead who was doing wellness work and who um, has presented on disclosure rounds and who's worked with staff on and mentored staff through disclosure. So I believe it was that pair um, who, who was mentoring or training. But like I said, there was 25 trained, but then I don't think, I think it fell off a little bit. Do you know more, Laurie? Uh, sorry, for the peer support program. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was an, an external organization that we brought in for a formalized training. Um, with those two, like, with, were those two leaders involved? Yes, yeah. they were yeah. the okay. champions for it and then um, co-led the training uh, with an external uh, partner. I believe the external partner for peer support was Joe Shapiro um, out of Harvard at the time, so... Great, and I just realized there's a Q&A button as well. So I'm gonna go to the Q&A because um, there's a couple of questions uh, teed up. Um, I think the first um, the first anonymous attendee wanted to think more about, uh, could you speak to some of the patient, ways that patients can report um, at MGH? And what I'm thinking here is the patient relations is, is sort of infiltrated across the hospital and the heart program is also another um, sort of reporting mechanism, but maybe Laurie and Christy, you can speak to how patients can raise their voice for safety at the hospital. Yeah, I think it's a really great question. Um, yes, of course, we have our patient relations process. Um, really, I think we view that as sort of a last resort in many ways uh, for patients to be able to raise concerns or complaints about their care or experience here. Um, we do provide um, sort of training to our uh, unit leadership. And um, there are, so there's sort of a, a few different mechanisms that we do to try to um, proactively identify where there may be um, some 
concerns with care. Um, leaders uh, proactively round on patients so that they're uh, checking in, not necessarily from their uh, direct uh, care provider. Um, we have um, contact information for the unit manager that is um, clearly visible and given to each patient and family upon their, their admission. So it's a, a place that they know that they can go to if there's something um, that they would like to uh, discuss with the unit uh, uh, in particular. Um, Kelly mentioned a heart. It's a it's a program that we uh, do to train all frontline staff on sort of the ability to have uh, discussions with with um, with patients if when they raise a concern, a way for us to sort of acknowledge, uh, to apologize, uh, to make sure that we're uh, taking action and following up uh, with those patients. Um, so I, I guess our, our main um, objective and hope is that we are uncovering uh, concerns from patients while they're here and that we're able to address those um, I, sort of in the moment with the care team and then our patient relations um, I, I program or, or service is here. Of course, if other patients don't feel comfortable uh, raising it within, their, uh, within the department or unit that they're in or it's something sort of after the fact or that, uh, that they would like to contact the hospital with. The other um, avenue that I know, so I'm part of a program with Tom Gallagher that we co-designed called We Want to Know, and the hospital, um, the our hospital, Michael Guerin Hospital, actually has a program that's similar to that, where they have uh, one of our patient relations team member go around and ask the hard questions um, in advance of that complaint or concern coming up in another way. Um, so that's another mechanism. So she's out there rounding, uh, talking to patients in while they're in the bed. And that really grew out of um, the COVID-19 challenges where patients uh, and, and their loved ones weren't allowed together oftentimes. And, and so this was just another way for us to more actively surveil uh, safety when um, everyone was feeling a little unsafe in the hospital. So I thought that that was a really fantastic program and we're working to write that up at, um, as a, a one of our research sort of uh, innovations from the, from the organization. Okay. Um, can you talk more about how you include patients and family members in event review? Um, do you want me to start, Christy? You can add in. Um, so a, a few different ways. Um, so they are, uh, we do have patient representatives on our medical quality and patient safety committee. Uh, and this is the committee that um, has our medical leaders, our administrative leaders, uh, and we meet monthly to review all critical, severe, and never events that occur within the organization. So it's through this mechanism um, that we have uh, patient representatives um, involved in these um, event reviews and review of the action plan. This is also uh, the committee that uh, we use to support sort of our monitoring of implementation uh, of those action plans. We also have patient and family representatives um, uh, included on our uh, quality committee of the board, uh, which um, uh, at least all of our critical incidents and our overall sort of quarterly um, uh, sort of analysis of all of our uh, patient safety incidents um, go to there, uh, go to that committee uh, for review and discussion. Um, I know uh, Christy spoke about sort of our disclosure policy and the, the patient addendum, and I think there's a question somewhere in the chat about sort of our process for reviewing our uh, uh, patient safety and incident uh, uh, management uh, processes here. Um, so for, and from that perspective, we do, uh, we're accredited on a four year cycle and we really use that as um, a nudge that every four years we go through the process of um, reviewing our pro our processes, our, our uh, policies. Some have to be updated more, more timely than that, but uh, to look at our, our program as a whole um, and intentionally uh, uh, work with our uh, patient experience panels. And we have designated uh, patient representatives that have a particular interest in quality and safety uh, that do a deeper dive review uh, with us on our um, processes. And it was out of that uh, review in advance of our last accreditation um, where there was particular interest around our disclosure pro policy and that's where uh, the patient addendum uh, uh, came came from I, I you summed it up Lori I think you I don't have anything to add about our patient uh, involvement I mean, I'm gonna paraphrase here from another question um, 
how what are some of the processes that we have in place or what you we might be dreaming of having in place in the future where we can really close the loop with all the individuals involved in the harm like i know oftentimes we talk about the clinicians and sort of the the immediate care staff but how do we sort of share our lessons learned um, in a broader way i think that's a great question and and i think you know, that is probably a universal struggle is to to bring back, to close that loop and bring back the learnings. And over the years, um, things like M&M rounds have been implemented and then pulled back and then implemented in a different way, quality rounds, uh, peer reviews, case sharing. Um, we've looked at and, and will likely be looking at soon a more standardized process across departments for learning. But again, um, have to get into sharing with the entire team. So a lot of the, the departmental plans that come out of an incident, um, they come to MQPSC for, for review of the plan and for input, and then those departments take them back to their teams and ideally work with the entire team. So the, the clinical resource leader, the nurse educator may take on that work, or if the department has a quality lead, and they'll look at implementing the changes and ideally would be looking with all um, care providers and then looping back. And we try to tie that education or that policy and practice piece to incidents. But I think, um, again, knowing that it's done to various degrees um, and there isn't always a, a standardized process in, in how that loop back gets back to frontline uh, teams. But the, the departmental plans that come, they do come back to MQPSC for like a report back often like six months later. And if it's been a cr critical incident, we have a tracker. So we have a color coded tracker where we're tracking um, like closure and, and completion of a lot of those incidents. And that gets reported, our, our tracker gets reported quarterly to the um, subcommittee that deals with quality from the board. Do you have anything else, Lori, would you say? Uh, I don't think anything further to add. Um, completely agree. It's a it is it's a it's a challenge for us for sure. Um, and definitely, I think we need to think of ways that we can do it better. And we're willing to learn. So if anyone has best practices that they can share, please do reach out to us. Um, we're at the. I'm not going to say we're at the start of the journey. We're sort of in the middle of the journey. <laughs> Um, with a lot of energy behind us moving forward. Um, so excited to to engage with this amazing team on that. Oh, I think I don't see any more questions or things in the chat. So I'm going to hand it back to Nicole to wrap us up. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and um, sharing your journey to candor readiness. And thank you to all of our participants. Um, I will probably follow up in, with an email if it's okay with our speakers and share the transparency policy with you. Um, and just know that the recording of this webinar will be up on our collaborative YouTube channel. So free, feel free to share it with your colleagues and we look forward to seeing you at our next session. So thank you so much and everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye, everyone.